Good morning, Rehoboth Church family. How are you doing this morning? Hi, how are you in the balcony? <laughs> oh, it's good to be here. It's good to be back and see you guys. For any who don't know, my name is Joy Stevens. I'm the other Joy, the red hair Joy. I answer to all of those. Um, and I have the pleasure of hanging out with you guys today um, to cover for the Fowler family. Woo while they uh, tend to very important family matters today, um, celebrating their daughter's upcoming nuptials. So it's good to be here. Let's all stand and uh, worship the Lord together this morning.
mercy, the amazing things he's done with us. We're going to sing with gladness and joy. Amen. Here we go. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Good morning, Rehoboth. Go ahead and have a seat. It is good to be with you today and good to see all of you today, and I hope you're happy to see me too, right? Um, anyway, hey, if this is your first time here with us at Rehoboth, we're so happy to have you and so happy that you've come to hang out with us this morning. We'd like to get to know you and how we can help you plug into our church, get to know what uh, we're about here. Uh, so if you would, after the service this morning, stop by our welcome table right over here. We'd like to get to know you. We've got a gift for you and help you get to know us as well. As well as if this is your first time tuning in with us online, you can reach out to us at pastor's office at Rehoboth.org, and we'd love to see you in person here soon uh, down here. 
Also, if you're not plugged into one of our small groups here at this church, I really want to encourage you to do so. You know, our Bible fellowships meet every single Sunday morning at 9.15, as well as right now we've got disciple groups that are forming. So if you'd like to participate or learn more about that, go to rehoboth.org slash connect. There's a place there that you can sign up and, and learn more. You can come talk to me after the service, and I'd be happy to give you some information on that. Camp Grace, uh, a second round of our students are headed to Camp Grace this week. So pray for them, pray for their leaders, pray that this would be a beneficial time spiritually. Students, we love you and we're praying for you. And we can't wait to hear what the Lord does uh, as you go this week. Also, our Rehoboth Classical Christian Academy is currently enrolling for the 2023-2024 school year. So if you'd like uh, to learn more about that, go to Rehoboth.org. Specifically, we're enrolling preschool, kindergarten, and first grade. You've heard over the last few weeks about our partners, the Garden Church in Baltimore with Pastor Joel Kurz. Joel was here and preached with us uh, a few months ago as well. Um, But uh, we're taking up a special offering this morning to just show some love and support uh, to their ministry and work there. They've just recently bought a building that they're basically renovating bit by bit themselves right now. So lots of work being done right there as well as the active ministry of that church. So if you'd like to participate in that, I really pray, I encourage you to prayerfully and generously uh, contribute to that. Uh, Go to the back. There's offering envelopes back there. Make sure to write garden on the envelope so that we'll know uh, where to put uh, those gifts uh, and dig deep so that we can bless our sister church in Baltimore this morning. Also, and just in general, uh, we want to thank you and continue to thank you for the way that y'all continue to be faithful and generous towards the ministry of this church that enables us to reach into our own community. And so if you'd like to give today, you can do that in the baskets in the back or online at rehoboth.org slash give, or you can mail your gifts into the church. So with that, let's continue on uh, in our time of worship this morning with some scripture. We're going to be reading from the book of Jude There's only one chapter, so it's easy to to navigate where we're headed here. But I'm going to start in verse 17. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. God, we just, we tremble before these words because we recognize their truth and their impact on our lives. God, we do pray by the power of the Spirit right now, help us to build ourselves up in this most holy faith that you have given to us, that you have preserved for us in the scriptures, Lord. God, keep us in your love. Keep us focused on the mercy that you have offered us through the Lord Jesus Christ, God. Lord God, we recognize that you have called us to care for one another, to bear one another's burdens, Lord. And God, to even go so far as to use the words of Jude here, to snatch one another out of the fire, Lord. But I would also take that, that we should be snatching others out of the fire in our community, Lord. There are people all around us who are marching towards an eternity due punishment for the rebellion that we have have pointed at you, Father. And we just ask that you would empower us to without fear, to pull people from the flames and to save others. God, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for what you have done for us. And Lord, we do praise you for the glory, the majesty, the dominion, and the authority that you will have, that you've had for all eternity, and God, that you will have for all eternity future, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and continue our time of worship together. Reading that verse. 
verse that of all of all the creatures on earth that God made, we were the ones who were given the ability to put into words who Christ is, and we were given the responsibility to declare that to the nations, to anyone who will listen, and just to declare it right now. And, and that's what this song is going to speak to as well. What creation suddenly
Rehoboth, it's good to be back with you after Tina and I were away last week. We're going to continue our series in the book of Acts. And if you want to go ahead and scroll on your screen or turn in your copy, printed copy of God's Word to Acts chapter 13, that's where we're going to be this morning. Let me, as you're turning there, mention a couple things. For the very first time, Archie Lennon is in the back back here with Stephen and Tara, new little baby in the Rehoboth family. We're delighted we're there. John, J.P. Skeeth, I was about to call your son's name. You and your mother-in-law are here with us today. And there, uh, J.P. and Rachel's little boy has just been born. And John Paolo, did I say it right? Skeeth, which also means John Paul or J.P. And uh, we'll be seeing him soon, delighted. I can't tell you yet, but there's more babies coming. Uh, well, I guess I did just tell you. I can't tell you who the parents are yet. That's the only thing I can't tell you. Uh, so th obviously the parents know uh, this is no surprise to them, but uh, they're just not quite ready for uh, the public announcements yet. But those things are coming. Let me also tell you, I'm so excited about what God's doing in our classical school. 23, 24 students already registered for the fall in our new school. This is just our second year and we keep adding classes. And uh, in addition to that, we're thrilled to announce today We've mentioned it in some generality, but Classical Conversations of East Atlanta is moving to the Rehoboth campus. This is a classical homeschool co-op group and uh, just thrilled about this additional education opportunity. High, high quality, solidly grounded in the Word of God, just like our classical school. The two are not competing because our classical academy is an all-day school and the co-op is homeschooling where they have classes one day a week. We already have some families involved in this group and just thrilled about what God's doing in that. And that's going to become especially even more so important to think about as we talk and lean into what this message shows us today in God's Word. This message is about gospel opposition. And uh, I tell you, my heart has just been been uh, swirling over these last days as we've seen the events happening in Ukraine and Russia and as this group, this mercenary group, which is really in some ways part of the Russian military, pulling out of the Ukraine and marching toward Moscow and looking like uh, Moscow was about to be under attack and, and then all, all of a sudden all the changes are there and uh, the, the highway that they were on headed to Moscow. I've been on that highway and there were images shown of military equipment parade, going, th not parading, but going through the streets of Moscow. And uh, there were a couple of those shots that, you know, you just recognize because you've walked them, you've driven them, you've been there as our family lived there as missionaries. As we think about that, we came in to be missionaries there not long after the Soviet Union had collapsed, where religion, especially biblical Christianity, was heavily oppressed. It was opposed. I, I have spent time in the homes of men and women who had been imprisoned for nothing more than their unwillingness to deny Jesus Christ. I've sat with families as they've told us about family members who were shipped off to concentration camps, gulags in Siberia, never to hear or see of them again. I have sat with a man whose father was a Baptist pastor, and, and he himself now at that time was a pastor. And he described how one day... Police showed up at the door, arrested his father, took him away, and three days later returned to their home with his bloody shirt. And they never saw him again. They never heard from him again. They never had a funeral to go to to bury his body. I, I have been with believers in places all around the world that have faced oppression and persecution to the point that they have been imprisoned, they've been tortured, they've been beaten, and family members and friends have lost their lives. They have become martyrs of the faith. For decades and decades and decades, it has been used in messages in North America, the fear that something like that could come one day. 
That day already arrived. We are just not simply living in the worst of it yet. But much worse is coming. I want to give you just two concrete examples, one of them right here in our own midst. As y'all know, we have been addressing and engaging and we have led out in our community the efforts to address Tucker's woefully misnamed, intentionally misnamed, non-discrimination ordinance. It is important that we say every time because who would stand against a non-discrimination ordinance? Because the truth is, we oppose all unjust discrimination Not simply in our church family, but in the workplace and in every place in our community and our society. There is no question in that regard. But these ordinances, or this ordinance, attempted to go so much beyond that, and in many ways has. And here's the reality, and y'all know that we have, have engaged this, we... Uh, worked with other churches, and and I pulled other uh, leaders together. We worked with uh, all who would work with us and business leaders to address this matter. And here's why. Do I have concerns that this ordinance now will not simply allow but will require every place of public accommodation, every restaurant, every club, every workout facility, every locker room that's available to the public, every bathroom? Am I concerned that this ordinance will now require that any biological male be allowed, given permission, and protected to be able to go into private spaces where women would have women's only facilities? You better believe I'm concerned about that. You should be too. It is not theoretical or hypothetical that harm will come from that. There are multiple cases already demonstrating emotional, psychological, and physical harm that has come from this in our country already. You should be concerned about those things. You and I should be concerned about a very small business, even of of a business that just has one employee and now how this ordinance is going to impact them when both the city of Atlanta, one of the most progressive cities in the country, refused to do what Tucker has done. But we didn't stand against those things publicly. And that's important to know. What we stood for was religious freedom for all people. Buddhists, Mormons, Catholics, Muslims. And we stood against any effort to strip away those religious freedoms. From the very first time this ordinance began being talked about in as early as 2020, the drafts of those ordinances seriously impinged upon religious freedoms. In July of 2022 of last year, when council members reached out to me, two who were working to draft this ordinance with some other activists in our community, they gave me 24 hours to look at a draft of the ordinance. At that time, I was also forbidden to share that with anyone else. Real open process, right? In that very first meeting, not even having a chance to give this to our legal counsel for there to review, in that very first meeting, looking at the ways this ordinance would engage religious freedom, I told our council members then, if you do not address this, if you do not take away the harms for religious freedoms, I will have no choice but to oppose what you're doing. This isn't China. This isn't North Korea. This isn't Iran. This isn't Sudan. This is our community seeking to put in place laws that will take away yours and my religious freedoms. We are long past the moment where we would say that there would be opposition to the gospel that goes beyond simply your neighbor saying, I don't ever want to hear you talk about church again. This ordinance was drafted or edited multiple times. 
on three different occasions, council members came back to me over this year. And in the very last version before they presented it publicly, they not only had taken away a little bit of the progress that it had made, though it had not been sufficient, they made it significantly worse in how it would have impacted religious freedoms. Every draft of this ordinance contained provisions and wording that would have forced religious beliefs on you and I in how we practiced. And that's why we stood. And not one time did we ever denigrate those in the LGBTQ community. In fact, if anything, in every opportunity I had to speak, I spoke against anyone doing so. Yet that's not what has happened toward us, toward me. I've been libeled on social media. I've been lied about in the community and social media. This church has been lied about. It continues even to just two days ago. Opposition is not something that is far, far away. Opposition is here today. We even put out a public statement to y'all that our city council had stating that the pastors of Rehoboth were not standing in opposition to the ordinance itself. We were standing in opposition to how it addressed religious freedom. Now, I have another example I need to give you to set up us digging into this text. But I need you to tell you this. I need to tell you this. But God... But God, just a week and a half before the city council voted six to one, our mayor was the only one who voted against this ordinance. I had convened a meeting, which it took extraordinary effort for this to even happen. I had to request multiple times of city council members to even meet with us. They finally met with me and 10 other leaders of religious organizations and churches in our community that ranged from a mosque to a predominantly African-American non-denominational church and everything in between. We had one of our attorneys with us who happens to be one of the leading attorneys in America addressing these kinds of matters. An attorney who has won court cases against Harvard University. This guy knows what he's doing. He is gentle, he is godly, he is competent. As we met with city council members who were drafting this ordinance to show them place after place after place after place where this ordinance violates First Amendment rights, constitutional rights, and religious freedoms, they gave no indication they would make any changes. No changes of substance anyway. The ordinance that they passed on June the 12th was a dramatically different ordinance in many ways. And for the first time ever in any of the drafts that they had put forward, and this is a draft that, that now on July the 12th will be law, they have largely withdrawn their encroachment of religious freedoms on religious organizations and done what we asked them to do a year ago. And you and I should celebrate before God that this has taken place. It has come at an extraordinary cost. But the Lord has prevailed. But as I put in our weekly e-blast a week ago last Wednesday, we should recognize that this was not a total victory. Because in fact, what this ordinance does essentially is says, we're going to protect eight of your ten fingers. Are you thinking carefully with me? Instead of our government saying we are going to seek to do right for all citizens and protect religious liberties, our government has still taken the posture 
that we are going to establish certain beliefs and practices that are going to supersede the religious beliefs and practices of some in our community. Not all. Some. This ordinance will not have near the impact on Rehoboth that initially, if it had gone forward as it had been drafted, would have. It would have had draconian impact upon us. Yet, this ordinance still contains wording that will force religious beliefs and practices on certain members of our community that are contrary to the word of God. And that ought to remain troubling to all of us. And before, and, and okay, so let me just pause here. If you've checked out for a minute and like, okay, I've heard this and I've heard this pastor move on. Okay, I'm transitioning and moving on. So let me give you a completely different example, okay? So children have all kinds of videos available to them. The, the, the videos that we used with our children, I'm talking about entertainment videos that are also educational. The ones that we used with our children, well, they are like in, well, they're in archives today. Nobody watches those hardly. But there's a host of other ones that are out there. One of those that still remains quite popular is called Blue's Clues. Really, really popular and catchy songs and, and it's been quite popular. Recently, they released a new song called the Blue's Clues Pride Parade. It is done around a person in identifying as drag queen Nina West. So it's visual. It's not just music auditory. And so you have something of a parade and everybody's got pride flags and Blue's Clues has animals. And so there are all these animals that are, have these and they're singing along. But the lead character in this is a cartoon image of this person who identifies as a drag queen. Children a year old, watch this. <coughs> Children three years old, watch this. I want you just to listen to some of the words. Uh, there are words in here that normally you wouldn't hear from a Christian platform. There's nothing horribly inappropriate about these words to be said in this context, but they're words that would normally not be used in this context. I'm not going to read you all of this, but I do want you to hear some of it. It begins, hey Blue, look at all these families. Hi families, it's time for a pride parade. Families marching one by one, hooray, hooray. Families marching one by one, hooray, hooray. This family has two mommies. They love each other so proudly and they all go marching in the big parade. And then each stanza <coughs> continues to build so that it's two by two, three by three, four by four. I won't read you each of those stanzas, but the first one talks about two mommies. The second one talks about two daddies. The third one talks about these babies are non-binary. The fourth one talks about trans members of this family. The fifth one says some people choose their family. The sixth one says ace, bi, and pan grown-ups. The seventh one says all families are made different. The eighth one says these families of kings and queens the ninth, fam the ninth one says, allies to the queer community. And the tenth one says, love is love you see. Th this isn't a government ordinance. This is common culture. And it is being used to normalize these perspectives not with those studying in academic arenas, but with our children who are one and two and three years old. This stands in stark opposition to biblical beliefs and practices. 
and whereby we would elect those who are our government officials, and whereby we would engage in a just democratic process in order to speak into those processes so that there would be changes and improvements. Even though some of our neighbors said we had no right to speak into those processes. This isn't a process like that at all. This is paid with advertising dollars and is readily available and is done with such high caliber music and graphics. It's attractive. It's appealing. And so before we transition in the text of God's word and we see how we think about this, I need to say this with as much clarity as I can. We live in a country and we live in a society that has made all of these things legal, right? We have the ability to speak into those processes through our elections and our democratic process. We do. We still do. But it is a spoken and confirmed fact that these perspectives, these lifestyles, these choices are legal in our country and our communities. And as much as you and I are able, we need not celebrate those things, but we must abide by them where we must. But them being legal does not make them in alignment with God's word and among the greatest in opposition to me and to this church has not come from the LGBTQ community. Are you hearing me? Do you know what the greatest where the greatest opposition has been from? From other religious organizations that identify themselves as churches and from individuals who identify themselves as either Christian professors or Christian pastors. That is where the greatest opposition has arisen. That is where the sharpest, most treacherous attacks that have been made personally against us have arisen. It hasn't been the LGBTQ community at all. In fact, when asked, most of the LGBTQ community who's had any direct engagement with me or with us have always acknowledged we have been treated respectfully, fairly, and kindly. And that is how we must be. So how do we think about these things? And what in the world does Acts 13 have to say with that? Well, keep your finger or your screen right there on Acts 13. But I want you to hear John 17 before we look at Acts 13. John 17, we often refer to it as the high priestly prayer. It is Jesus praying to the Father about the disciples. This is just prior to his crucifixion. It is Jesus being um, uh, it's Jesus revealing his heart to us and for us to see what the days ahead will look like. Jesus says to the Father, I have given them your word. This is his word. It was, is, and will be our guide for life and faith. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask you that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one, from Satan himself. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth, your word. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. For their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Now, let's think about this. 
And this is going to help us understand and see Acts 13. You and I have been saved from this world. Right? Some of y'all need some saving. We have been saved from this world and our sin. We've been made alive in Christ. We have been made new creatures. We have been taken from the kingdom of darkness and placed into the kingdom of light. Those two kingdoms are not compatible. In fact, Jesus says that those who are in my kingdom will be hated by those who are not in my kingdom. Notice he didn't say that those who are in my kingdom should hate those who are not in my kingdom. Make that distinction clear. Secondly, we are not of this world. We haven't been taken out of this world. We remain in this culture. Yet, we sometimes take this idea that we are not of this world means that we ought to put around ourselves kind of like a a spiritual bubble wrap and just wait on Jesus to come back and hope and pray that there's still some of those bubbles that don't get popped and we're safe and secure until he gets here. That's not this picture at all. Think about this. Jesus said these words and just hours later was hanging on the cross. There was no bubble wrap. There were no resets. There were no, like in a, in a video game, that you, you, you gobble this up or you shoot this or you jump over that and you get a new life. None of that happened. We have been saved from this world and made alive in Christ, yet we are not of this world, yet we have not been taken out of this world. We are to live in this world, and he says... We are being sanctified to stand in this world. Um, Tina grew up in northeastern Arkansas. And um, it's it, like a good part of the Midwest can have some horrific tornadoes come through. There, there are still homes in the small town that she grew up with that you, you look and you think, what is that out in the yard? You know, if you want to have fun in a conspiracy theory, you think, well, that's a bomb shelter. Uh-uh. It is a hurricane shelter to get down below the ground because they had seen hurricanes come through and wipe out everything. You and I need to understand that we live in a world where there are spiritual tornadoes that are around us all the time. And our, our storm shelter is not a bunker that we go hide into. It is the word of God by which we are sanctified so that we may stand. What is it that Jesus, through Paul, told the disciples in Ephesus about their, their, their spiritual armor? It wasn't so that you could go around and look really sharp, act really confident and mature. It was so that you could stand against the schemes of our adversary. And then finally, this text here in John 17 doesn't simply say that you and I are to gather and just kind of hide out and and hope that the rescue ship comes in and gets us. Jesus prayed this over his disciples as he says to them in the Father, I am sending them out into the storm. Do you hear that? We are gathering here today And there ought to be a grand celebration and there has been in our music. That should be a part of our worship every week. We should celebrate the grace and sanctification and security we have in Christ Jesus. But dear friends, we are gathering here today that we might recharge, rearm, refit, rest and prepare to go back out. You are the church every day, either gathered or sent. 
And his purpose for all of us is not that we would simply walk around saying, I am not of this world, so I don't have to engage. No, 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 friends. You and I are not to live and think like this world, but we are to be in the midst of it proclaiming, living out the good news of Jesus Christ. On the day of judgment, will our friends and neighbors declare, but they never told us. They never said, this is the truth. They never told us that Jesus said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one. No one comes to the Father except through me. Will our friends and will our family and will our neighbors say, we saw them go to church, but we never heard them proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. We heard them complain about our mutual neighbor, but they never lifted up Jesus in our conversations. They were kind and gentle to me. I thought they completely affirmed the way I lived. They never told me God had a different plan. Even in a gentle voice. So how does this all apply to Acts 13? Turn there. Acts 13 verses 4 through 12. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit... They went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, Salamis is one of the coastal cities in Cyprus, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John, that's John Mark, to assist them. When they had gone through the whole world as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the magician, that is Bar-Jesus, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. And he said... You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed... When he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished. Say these last couple words with me. At the teaching of the Lord. Let me share with you some thoughts quickly to take all that we've talked about and see its application here in Acts 13. Why is there opposition to the good news? Well, ultimately, there's three things for us to see. We go with the Spirit. We go with the power of the Spirit. We stand against the schemes of the devil. And we proclaim the gospel to make disciples of Jesus. These three are why we see opposition to the good news of Jesus in Acts 13. And let's... Take just a couple quick minutes and break these apart. First, we go with the Spirit in the power of the Spirit. Notice in Acts 13 verses 4 through 12, twice it's mentioned about the Spirit of God. First, them being sent out by the Spirit of God. And then in verse 9, where Paul, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, looks at Elimus and he declares these things to him. Part of the challenge that you and I experience on a daily basis is that we seek to confront these matters in our own strength, in our own power, and what we perceive to be the strength of our collective body. 
Now granted, there truly is strength of our collective body, but we must understand you and I have been commissioned not by this church, not by this pastor, not by your Bible fellowship leader, not by your mother, not by your father. You and I who are followers of Jesus Christ, when you walk out of here today, you have been commissioned and sent out to be an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ in an opposition field. Well, don't get so excited. You have been called by God, indwelt by His Spirit, made alive in Christ, and empowered by the Spirit of God to be such an ambassador. Your ambassadorship, hear me, your ambassadorship is first and foremost not to give you the rights to go to heaven. Your ambassadorship is to be and do exactly what Jesus prayed over his disciples shortly before his own crucifixion. That you would be sanctified by the word which only happens through the Holy Spirit of God. It is a yielding of yourself and your abilities. It is a submission before God himself and his spirit. Your strength, your boldness, your power, your confidence to stand in the midst of these storms only comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. Your authority to go and have these conversations is not based on the fact that you've either had this class or that class. Where you've learned this apologetic statement or that apologetic statement. Do you know the greatest apologetic resource that you have? It's the Word of God. A friend of mine, a number of years ago, he was pastoring in a town where there was a pseudo-Christian group. They had many of the biblical practices, but they had steered way off of the gospel. They could quote New Testament and Old Testament passages better than most who were in a biblically gospel-centered church. He was having extraordinary effectiveness in sharing the gospel with members of this pseudo-Christian group and seeing them turn and genuinely follow Jesus Christ. I was intrigued and I wanted to know, what are the three steps you're using? Simple as this. He said, I won't have a conversation with them unless they'll sit down and read the Word of God with me. And I won't sit down and read the Word of God with me unless they're willing literally to read all the way through, verse by verse, Meeting by meeting, the gospel of Acts. So, not that they were reading the entire book of Acts every time they got together, but first time they got got together, they'd read chapter 1. And they'd talk about it. Not about what I thought, about what you thought. Here's what it says. Here's what happened. Here's what Jesus said. Here's what the disciples said. Here's what the gospel is proclaimed to be. Dear friends, your greatest resource in having these conversations that the Holy Spirit will empower the most is the Word of God. Secondly, you and I need to see that not only are they sent out, but we need to see that they are filled with the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that they have some special unction. It means that they are walking closely with the Lord. That they have yielded to His Word. That they seek to become more and more like Jesus. And that they die to self more and more and more. It means that they are yielding to the Spirit of God. And they are walking in Him. Then the next thing that we had mentioned that that this passage shows us why there is opposition to the good news of Jesus is that we stand against the schemes of the devil, of our adversary. When you and I think about this world and how things are, sometimes people will make the statement, well, I just don't know why things are the way they are. Yes, you do. You do understand why things are the way they are. When when sin occurred in the Garden of Eden, the hearts of humanity were changed and would forever be changed. Whether it is gossip or dishonesty or theft or any other manner of disobedience before God, whether it be that 
or, or, or a person who is having an extramarital affair or, or premarital sexual relationships, all of these matters are found not in the actions of the hands and the body. They are found first and most in the heart. These things are happening in our world because our hearts are desperately wicked. And Satan and his minions, not the little characters that we see in a, in a movie, but the demonic forces, the fallen angels with him have sought to influence and affect everything to stand against God and his ways. Everything to stand against the word of God. And, and, and hear me, the greatest scheme he has is exactly what he used with Adam and Eve. It is not to say, forget this, abandon this, reject this. It is to simply take what God has actually said and twist it just a little bit. Drop off just a few words. Make a slight change and say, God didn't really say that, did he? That's his greatest scheme and it's the scheme that is ultimately one that we find so at play today. In verse 8, God's word says, But Elimus the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Satan is not simply seeking to put us in a place where Presbyterians and Baptists are having discussions about the covenant and the ages. What Satan is about is seeking to put everything in a place to turn people away from the good news of Jesus Christ. Everything we see at play in our culture, in our communities, even in our governments, everything that Satan is influencing is to turn people away from the gospel, from the good news of Jesus Christ. There specifically are some things that you and I must be prepared to stand about because they are denials of the word of God and ultimately a denial of the gospel itself. One of those schemes that we see that Satan is so pro, uh, propelling around us is that there are no binary truths. A binary truth is when there are two sub-truths that are put together, that are held together as one truth. And what is commonly being discussed today and propagated both from academia and our colleges all the way down into our elementary schools, in our movies, in our ads, in our restaurants, in our stores, even to the place of what beer somebody would buy is that there are no binary truths. Some of those truths that are seeking to be rejected are things that God and humans are different that is the binary truth. We are not God and he is not human. They are seeking to make God and humans the same. Another binary truth is that men and women are different. They are. Yet, today, what there is an effort to do is to make it so that it is not simply that men and women are no longer considered different, but that there is no such thing as male and female gender. There are all manner and any manner of identities that someone might claim and decide. That the scriptures never gave a binary truth of men and women. So if you then take away the idea that God and humans are not different, and you make God and humans the same, then humans can make whatever pronouncements, dictates that they may choose to do. Here's another one that is so subtle that we see it so dangerously playing out is that children and adults are not different. Um, this, this has so many ranges. The idea that children and adults should have the same authority and the same decision-making abilities. There are 
teachers who have been removed from their classrooms and schools because they have said they will not be a part of allowing and telling a six-year-old girl that she can identify as a boy and we're going to hide it from her parents. School boards that have chosen to place pornographic and sexually explicit and deviant materials in libraries where even the youngest of children are allowed to see them and to experience them because the idea is children and adults are not different is an affront to the word of God. The idea that a person's lived experience overrules and stands above the authority of the word of God is a dangerous, dangerous slope. Because what we're saying is the lived experience of a three-year-old dictates the truth of their life. Well, I'm just telling you, the lived experience of most three-year-olds involves things that would, have, would, would ultimately harm them greatly. And you say, Troy, you're making this ridiculous because you're using, th- okay, let's make it 14-year-olds. Now, help me out here. If you are 50 years and older, I want to see your hands go up. Okay, there's a few of us in here. We're proud of it too, aren't we? Are we not? Absolutely. You think back to your 14-year-old self. I know. You've tried to forget those days as much as you could. But you think back to your 14-year-old self. You think back to the things you thought were absolutely true when you were 14. That your 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 year old self would say that was absolute rubbish. You think back to the decisions you made as a 14 year old. It is any wonder you made it to 50. Some of you, your guardian angels are bruised and battered protecting you. Because of your 14 year old decisions. And yet we want to say the lived experience of a 14-year-old should give them the authority to make radical life-changing, altering decisions and their parents are not even allowed to know? You, You see, this is not simply about sexuality. That's what it's put forward as. But what this is really about is that you, as a human being, a person, are God-like and can make ultimate decisions of all reality. It leads into a host of other areas of schemes against Satan that there is no biblical masculinity and biblical femininity and anyone who would claim those or espouse those should not be tolerated. It's an interesting thing that is taking place in our culture and our society today that those who would espouse these things that frankly most of culture and world has rejected for almost the entirety of experienced life on this planet. Yes, there have been expressions of those. But do you realize that even in say like the Greek government or the Roman life or even if we want to take any of the Canaanite civilizations about the only time we saw these things experienced as normative were in the cultic temples or in their palaces. Those were the only places generally that those were accepted and normative and practiced. Dear friends, there is nothing more beautiful than biblical masculinity and biblical femininity. And anybody who would ever espouse that biblical masculinity opens the door for abuse and neglect of women is absolutely wrong for the scriptures are absolutely clear that that is abominable before the Lord. Abuse of any kind is abominable before God. And we ought to celebrate. In this church, we do celebrate the accomplishments of both our men and our women. Other schemes that lead out into these areas is that family is anything we say it is. And, and let me be clear. We have, we have families that have 
it's hard to even use proper wording anymore. Blended, single families, there are a host of those. We love every one of them. We wrap our arms around every one of them. We love you. We stand with you. But I'm just going to tell you, I have never met a single mom or a single dad who says, I'm really glad my marriage didn't work out and I'm thrilled to be a single parent. Now, sometimes they are deeply grateful to be out of the horribly abusive situation they were in. We love our single members who are unmarried, some previously married, some never married, some widowed. We absolutely adore you. You are created in the image of God equal to every one of us. But we also affirm that God's word shows clearly that his plan and the best practice for all families is that there be one husband and one wife until death does them part. We will continue to teach that and affirm that because ultimately our culture wants to push everything about family aside so that our culture can establish that anyone can be godlike and anyone can establish whatever truth they want. It keeps going and the list is almost endless that it's being said more and more openly, your children are not your own. That is not some ancient communistic euphemism or some ancient African proverb. That is an attempt even today by our culture and our education industry to have primary influence over our children. Some would argue that modesty is a form of slavery and that people should and can wear whatever, whenever... Others would argue that religious freedom is sacred only for those who affirm these truths that are becoming such a dominant religion in our culture. And others would say that any belief or behavior that is accept any belief or behavior is acceptable except biblical Christianity. So not only do we go with the power of the Spirit of God. But as we proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, as Paul did here, all of those who are seeking to turn people away from the faith, we must be willing to stand. Not harshly, not vindictively, not judgmentally. Every one of us, every one of us is a sinner saved by grace. But every sinner is in need of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, you and I must proclaim the gospel to make disciples of Jesus. What is it that Paul and Barnabas and John Mark were doing as they went to Cyprus? Tina and I and our kids had a chance to be on the island of Cyprus a number of years ago. We had to go there for a a missions meeting when we were serving in Russia I mentioned this once in a while, those meetings usually happened in June, and those of us who were serving in these really cold climates complained, um, why, why are you taking us out of the, the, one of the colder countries in the world, and you are taking us in the only one or two months where it's moderate temperature-wise, why are you doing it then? Why, why don't you take us out in the middle of the winter and, and let us go someplace kind of warm. And so they decided that year, that was a, uh, the next year, it'd be a great idea. So they took us all to Cyprus. And for the first time in 40 years, it snowed in Cyprus while we were there. <laughs> but God, God giveth, God taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. <clears throat> they, they go to the island of Cyprus and they're not their sightseeing. It's a beautiful island, wonderful people. They make their way across the entire island. What are they doing? They are not going about, first and foremost, proclaiming against magicians. Not illusionists, magicians. 
They are going about proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, seeking to not simply have people say, yep, I want to pray a prayer and add Jesus. They are calling people to turn away from the things of this world, turn away from the schemes of Satan, and turn to the life-giving good news of Jesus Christ and follow him to be born again and made alive. And that's what they're about. Satan hates that. He does everything he can to to turn culture and community away from that. And he does that even there. And yet, what is remarkable in all of this is that that in verse 12, we, we made an emphasis of it as we read it. Here they've proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ. Elimus has opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the gospel. Paul has stood in opposition to the lies that are being told. And then God's word says, the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished. Not at the miracle. He was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Dear friends, If you today desire to follow Jesus Christ and to be his disciple, to turn away from this world and follow him to not simply save you for eternity, but to give you true life today, joy and satisfaction, hope for the moments in which you're walking, the invitation to you is just as it was to the proconsul. Call upon the Lord to save you. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and to choose this day that you will follow after Jesus Christ. If that's the desire of your heart, even while you're sitting right there, you don't even have to close your eyes. I just ask you to pray, Lord, I want to be saved. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I don't know how. I'm not even sure I'm strong enough to, but I will turn and I will follow Jesus from this day forward with his word being my guide. If you pray that, friends, I just ask you, come talk to us after the service. Let us take those steps with you. Let us walk with you. And for our entire Rehoboth family, We should celebrate the work of the Lord and what he's done even with this ordinance. But understand, our calling in life is not simply to stand regarding these types of ordinances. It is to be in this world, not of this world, sent, standing, and making disciples. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you've shown us today. Thank you for giving us great encouragement and hope that we too are empowered by the same Spirit, your Holy Spirit, that Paul and Barnabas and John Mark were filled with. Oh, Father, that we would be faithful to go out of this place today. That we would be faithful to walk in your word according to your word and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and stand when the storms of this world come against us. And Father, may we be fruitful, give us favor that we would see disciples follow Jesus. It's in his name we pray, amen.
Amen, amen. It's been good to be with you in the Lord's house this uh, Lord's Day here, church, and I love all of you. We love each other. We love our Lord. Be committed to doing good this week. Meditate on the Word of God and go and serve in this community. You're dismissed.